Hey guys, today I'm looking at Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. This was Marilyn Robinson's first novel. It was published in 1980. I tried reading Gilead when that book was published. That was her second book uh, back in the early 2000s, but uh, I, I got bored with it, wasn't able to finish it, and uh, that's it's kind of rare for me not to finish a book. I finish like 90% of the books that I start, but anyways, I decided to go back and take a look at Housekeeping because this book has just been on my to-read list forever. Uh, so I started reading it, getting into it. There's just a lot of family history uh, in the first several pages of this book. You can tell uh, we're dealing with three generations of, uh, of a family called Fosters, um, mostly women. First generation, there's the patriarch, uh, who actually doesn't exist in this novel. Um, he had died uh, earlier from a tragic train accident. A train had derailed off a bridge into a lake. Uh, and then there's his wife, Sylvia, who raises up the next generation. And from there, significantly, there's Helen, who I'd say is one of the most powerful characters in the book, even though she also does not exist in the timeline of this book, and Sylvie. Uh, it's kind of as a result of the father's death. Uh, the character Helen had left town, come back, uh, and then she had died as well from an apparent suicide into the same lake uh, that her father had gone into. Um, and then there's Sylvie, one of the main characters of this book. She, she left town and then she led the life of a drifter. She's just very dispossessed. Uh, but then she comes back at the start of the book around age 35. Then there's the third generation, which concerns the children of Helen, Ruth and Lucille. Now, Ruth is the narrator of this book, and this book is told in the first person. And at the beginning of the book, Ruth and Lucille, they're being taken care of by much older relatives who are really inept at parenting. And then Sylvie comes back into the picture, at which point the, uh, the caretakers just flee the first chance they get. Um, this book's kind of interesting because, you know, major changes in this family's dynamics just can take place so quickly, just in a couple lines. So, uh, the first few pages of the book, it takes a while for us to get situated. Then the main narrative uh, drive really starts to take place when Sylvie comes back to town and sets up housekeeping. Um, now, these remaining descendants, you know, the more time they spend with each other, you start to see affinities develop between... Uh, Sylvie and Ruth especially, because I think um, Sylvie looks upon Ruth sort of as a younger version of her dead sister Helen, and Ruth looks up to Sylvie also as a version of, of Helen, uh, and sort of like as a surrogate mother. Lucille, on the other hand, is sort of off on her own. She's got this ability to cope with the uh, inherited loss and tragedy of this family, the direct tragedy of uh, the loss of her mother. And she also has a picture of how she needs to grow up and become the image of a certain type of woman in her mind. Now, this book takes place in a small town called Fingerbone, which is somewhere in the Northwest. I want to say Idaho. It's, it's a place where no one wants to be, it seems. It's, there's just a lot of mention of uh, this bridge that connects the rest of the world to the town and how it's always there as a possible exit. A lot of these characters think about or actually end up fleeing the town. It's cold, inhospitable, there's lots of descriptions of snow and rain and the lake, water, death, freezing lake, deep woods, vacant houses with uh, wandering mysterious town folk and orphans. It's almost as if the town itself is a character in this book. Kind of this very oppressive, constant element. So that's the kind of setting the girls have to deal with. But what's really interesting is the character of Sylvie, who you don't really get a good sense of her abilities as a caretaker or a guardian. Uh, there's always this concern about, you know, how stable is she? Is she going to stick around? She seems to have no awareness of time, and a lot of her own experiences just have taken place on boxcars, which she's jumped, and different characters she's met along the way, and their stories, whether it's true or not. 
Um, she may have been homeless most of her life, possible mental condition, not concerned with regular societal conventions like going to school on time or, or going to school at all. And uh, Ruth especially forms a, a bond with Sylvie. Uh, the narrative voice of this book, the prose itself, is extremely lyrical. It's almost poetic, so much so that you kind of have to suspend your disbelief that this type of articulation can come from a character like Ruth. And that discrepancy of poetic language and character, I find to be a hallmark of what I call soft, soft core literary books, like the Oprah selections, which I can forgive here and I definitely found more interesting because I found this prose itself to be a little peculiar. I could sense that it was trying to reach out and express and communicate, but would sometimes turn away awkwardly and kind of curl up in the comforts of its own interiority. Kind of like the prose itself was writhing in its own pain. And I didn't really think of this as the character Ruthie herself. I was thinking of this as more of a primordial voice in general. And as a result, it, it made me want to reach out. Um, and this kind of, might sound kind of weird, but it made me want to reach out to the prose and envelop it like, like you would a wounded animal. Not out of pity, like if you were to see like a one-legged bird. More out of fascination that such an animal not only exists, but is able to endure. And that connectivity between the... Um, the writing and the reader, it just makes this a, a more raw reading experience. Then the arc of the book in the end starts going into this really deep and dark place. I'd say the character of Helen, uh, who doesn't exist in this book except only as an absence, is probably the most powerful character in this novel because of the effect she has on her descendants. I mean... Ruth and Sylvie, they both understand this. Uh, they begin to understand the power that a bereaver has and almost seems to embody that role themselves. Sylvie takes Ruth under her wing and together they share that state, that state of mind of a drifter, kind of like being ghost-like. Uh, it's kind of a way for them to commune with the dead, but at the same time, exert their power over the living. And in this case, uh, the living is really only one other person, and that's Ruth's sister, Lucille. It's almost as if Marilyn Robinson's posing the question, you know, which side is it better to be on, the bereaver or the bereaved? And I think if you were, you know, in any kind of human, you'd find yourself in one of those two roles eventually. And knowing that you really need to have both the presence and the absence to fully understand another person. Which ultimately gives this book what I think is its lasting appeal. I think it'll always have a certain timelessness because if it hasn't happened already, it's inevitable. We'll all come across that reality of loss of a loved one even if that loved one is still living, the burdens of memory, personal growth that comes up out of that, I can see this book being not only nourishing and enlarging the empathy quotient in people, but it can also serve as one of those companions that can help people through their hard times. You know, help them help them cope and feel less alone. Um, maybe even in their deepest depressions, still stay alive. There are a couple books out there like this um, that can actually save people's lives. I know that sounds kind of corny, um, and that's something I can appreciate about this book. I don't know if I'm going to go and read the rest of what Marilyn Robinson's published since, but this book was impressive for how deep it went, and I definitely recommend it for people uh, who are hungry and in need of this kind of food.